And I would like to just start by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, the MSU Denver Department of Art and the Center for Visual Art acknowledges the privilege we have to gather in this place. Once the territories and homelands of so many indigenous peoples, including the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations, both of whom who were subject to genocide and forcibly removed from this land. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and value the knowledge systems they have developed in relationship to the lands. We collectively understand that offering a land acknowledgement neither absolves settler colonial privilege nor diminishes colonial structures of violence at either the individual or institutional level. Land acknowledgements must be accompanied with ongoing commitments to displaced indigenous and immigrant communities. In order to learn more about the spatial relationships of indigenous communities to lands, we recommend visiting native-land.ca and exploring the interactive map. There are many ways to support, support indigenous people today, including through local organizations such as the Denver Indian Center and the Denver Indian Family Resource Center. So I'd also like to thank the MSU Denver Art Department faculty members, Lisa Abendroth and Jessica Weiss, for their work in developing this statement. So since I'm acknowledging labor, I want to also acknowledge my amazing staff here at CVA, Melanie, who's just been running around figuring out all the tech. She had to leave to go pick up her daughter, but she I'm sure would love to be here for this talk. But she's our gallery manager and um, such an awesome problem solver. Katie, who's our education manager, who's engaged our audiences through tours and discussions and also stepped up with this exhibition to work really closely with a lot of our partners. Molly, our budget manager, who's worked on getting everyone paid and processing all their paperwork, and I think she needs to talk to you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Jenna, who um, is our communications manager and makes sure you all heard about the exhibition and this talk. And of course, to our incredible student staff um, who give their all and do so much to um, make our space so wonderful, the exhibition so meaningful, they engage our audiences on a daily basis, and some of them even sing during our installations and our staff meetings. You know who you are, Allison. Um, <laughs> so we couldn't do it without you, and we love working with you. I love working with all of you, and I'm so grateful to have you. I also want to acknowledge our leadership council, who is a group of volunteers who spend time helping spread the word and growing our community. So um, thank you so much for being here and for all the work you do to support CVA. So if you aren't familiar with CVA, the Center for Visual Art, we are the off-campus art gallery for MSU Denver. And we work to promote dialogue about contemporary urban issues through the catalyst of contemporary art. Um, we pose a lot of questions and, and dialogue. We don't always have the answers or solutions, but that's our hope is that we come to solutions. Um, and with this exhibition in particular, it was inspired by artist Sammy Lee, who did a paper, a felted paper mural that depicted um, a data visualization of food insecurity in Colorado. That mural is was outside for three months in the winter and we've um, rehung it here inside. Um, but that was sort of the cornerstone for this exhibition. Um, and a lot of this, both of these exhibitions, Banana Craze and Cultivate, um, do such a wonderful job of bringing the problems to the forefront so we can think about and ruminate on some of the issues that our society is facing, but it can also become really overwhelming. And, you know, when you look at the statistics, it's like, wow, this is really depressing. What can we possibly do? So one thing I was really drawn to and love about Desert Art Lab is that they are being really creative about solutions and finding new ways to approach agriculture. Um, so finding solutions of rethinking the way we use land and approach growing, incorporating lessons from ancient agriculture and indigenous practices. So I'm so excited to hear um, what they have to say. Desert Art Lab is an interdisciplinary artist collaborative co-directed by April, okay, I'm gonna really try not to butcher your last name, April 
Bayorquez, the Jorquez, um, and Matthew Garcia, whose work promotes indigenous perspectives on ecological practice and climate change. They have exhibited their work in Paris, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Santa Barbara, Australia, many other places. They have many exhibitions coming up. So be on the lookout. There's an exhibition right now in the Springs, Hello Springs oh, yep. Fine Art Center. Um, they've been guest presenters at the International Symposium on Electronic Art and HASTAC, which you'll have to share with us what that stands for, in Lima, Peru. April and Matt were awarded the Creative Capital Grant in 2016. They live and work in Pueblo, Colorado. Please help me welcome them to the podium. They're already here, but welcome <laughs> them and we'll see you again. Thank you all. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Cecily, for that um, wonderful introduction. And thank you for the land acknowledgement. Today we're here to actually share our practice, which is also embedded in an in indigenous um, Chicanx uh, perspective and um, knowledge system. So uh, we will. Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, I really wanted to, is this working? Yes. Oh, is it no, working? No. Yeah, okay, no, it sounds like, okay. yeah, no, it sounds um, okay. <laughs> This is a fantastic space. It's a beautiful space. Uh, thank you for having us. We're really uh, thrilled to be here. And uh, thank you to Cecily and her team. And uh, um, we'll start. So <clears throat> Desert Art Lab started in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. That's initially where we, we started our, our journey. And Phoenix is um, a lot of things, but it's, it's known as kind of the suburban abyss, you know, track homes forever. And um, for us at the time that we started this, um, it's also known for uh, recreation, the Sun Belt, the Fiesta Bowl, golfing, you know, uh, this is the Phoenix experience. But for us at the time that we started this project, um, it's not there. This this is our experience. So this is Central Phoenix, and I'd say 2000, and well, up to 2000. You know, there's still parts of it like this, and this is this is the downtown at the time. It's probably 2010, downtown Phoenix. 60% of Phoenix was vacant lots. Uh, downtown Phoenix, stripped, and so um, we had this conversation about. <clears throat> what the desert kind of is and what what we you know what's kind of projected onto it and part of our com our conversation was we knew it was more than that when you go into central phoenix in 2010 it's a wasteland um but you know the sonoran desert is really where phoenix is nestled and that's one of probably the most biodiverse regions in the world and it's a desert so we knew it wasn't that wasteland that we saw so as artists, we wanted to respond to this this conflict, and and um, as people who generationally come from these lands, we also, you know, we we knew that it wasn't through our inherited practice. So the practice that we learned from our our grandparents, our great grandparents, um, all the knowledge that was passed down to us. So to address this conflict between what this space had become and what it was we started a series of planting performances in 2010 and what we did with these is we we thought well, we would return indigenous ecology back to the urban space and so what you see here are a series of you see there's april there with the the, the, the cactus right you see me with the cactus and these were just kind of these solo efforts against this kind of post-industrial wasteland Turns out we, you know, as artists at the time in Central Phoenix, we were exhibiting it, showing the films. People liked it. They would come up to it. They'd ask us and they would say, they, they, they wanted to plant. They wanted to plant some. We thought this was a solo effort, but we quickly realized many wanted to be a part of this. So the project grew. Um, and we also realized that if we realistically wanted to change the landscape, especially this degraded urban landscape, there was no way that we could do it on our own. So this is another, it grew and this is another project, a, a local um, 
kind of a community activist organization wanted to start a community garden in central Phoenix in 115 degrees in this middle of the summer to, to, to start what we co would consider a traditional garden. It takes a lot of resources. So we, we proposed a, a mass cacti space um, and uh, they went for it. So we, we created this mass cacti planting performance at a vacant lot in a central Phoenix neighborhood. And we called it Fields to Freedom. Um, what was interesting about this, uh, this, this installation was that um, at the time, and uh, obviously it still is, urban gardening was very popular. However, this organization didn't have the resources that other organizations had to fund such a program. Um, so considering Phoenix, you're trying to grow things like kale, maybe um, you need shade, especially in extreme heat in the summer, you need a sprinkler system, you need outside water. So we're talking 30, 40, $50,000 to create a community garden. And for us, the especially um, in particularly the location of the space that it was located in urban central Phoenix in a historic barrio um, with like 99% Latinx indigenous people who are living there, um, we're like, we could plant a cactus garden that could feed the entire community for nothing. <laughs> but they didn't work out. So <laughs> what happened is the landowner came over to the site and um, the, the, this community activist group had been working with the person who'd owned this vacant lot. And this lot had probably been vacant for 50 years. The landowner came out, saw the saw it, walked out and said, is this an art installation? Which was pretty surprising. We were like, wow, you know, he gets it. <laughs> um, but he said, he said, there's cactus, get, get them out of here. I don't want cactus on my land. I don't want cactus in this community. No kidding. So, you know, for us as artists, we were like, it's all information. You know, we we're like, this is interesting. Like the conflicts beyond what we were considering. So um, we keep moving along. Um, and we also realized the limits of like physical space. And so at that point, we started this project called the Mobile Eco Studio. And that, that is a, that's part of the installation here. It's a video that you'll see. And this was a mobile space to have these conversations in, in Central Phoenix at the time. And, and the context of Central Phoenix at the time was, this was 2012, 2013. There was a thing called SB 1070. I don't know if anybody remembers that over here. Basically, it was an illegal, uh, unconstitutional anti-immigration law that was passed by the state legislator that basically created a situation where there was checkpoints in Phoenix, uh, checkpoints in Latino neighborhoods where basically papers were getting checked. No kidding. This, yeah. this was really happening. So we realized our attempts to create like spaces were limited because people couldn't leave their neighborhoods. So the mobile eco studio was an attempt to address that and to say, well, let's take it to them and let's take the conversations about indigenous ecology and and really kind of how do we change this wasteland? Because the, most of these neighborhoods that had checkpoints in them were also just those neighborhoods that I showed you where they're pretty much scraped. Um, the, 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 the video is in the installation, so I won't play it. So you can <laughs> go over there and spend some time with that. And, and the other thing that, so Matt mentioned a wasteland, the other thing that we were really um, problematizing was the idea of the desert as a wasteland. And what we were seeing was that actually the desert that we know and we grew up with and the desert that we use and have a relationship wasn't the same desert wasteland that what that wasteland's a projection and that was based on other systems right that have decided that you know the desert wasn't valuable and it was more valuable for the lots to be scraped yeah. and empty right so um i'm going to show some information here so as we start to move on in our practice we start to do exhibits we, we end up getting like attention for this stuff and we start doing exhibits outside of arizona and we start sharing this work around the region and around the country and even around the world and as we do that we're starting to dig into what this means to live in the drylands and I, I, well, this map is a map from the powell exp expedition into this into the west 
you know, the Western part of the country, much of it was Mexican and New, it was New Spain and then it was Mexico and the U.S. fought a war against Mexico and, and they got it, you know. Mm -hmm. So they sent an expedition to find out what they what what they got. And um, Powell went back to he, he surveyed the land. He went back to Washington and he showed him this map and he said, you have a desert. That's what you have. You have a place with no water. And you can see this boundary it says eastern boundary of the arid region. And then this one says the uh, western boundary of the arid region. And this goes up into the San Francisco Bay Area. That's what you see right outside of it. And this is basically the regions of the arid regions of the United States as uh, deemed by by Powell. The, 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 the. Um, okay. Here's another I would like to share is at that time, um, at once that expedition came back with that information, they started calling this region the Great American Desert. And if you look really closely here, you'll see the Platte River right here and Denver's right in there. Of course, we're down here a little south, but the desert's pretty big. Um, so th for, for, you know, a, 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 for, for decades, for generations, this, this whole region was considered the Great American Desert. I was just going to say, um, yeah, um, I was just going to point out that it, we also like to laugh about how the the ecological regions like stop right at the border. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Uh, here's another map. This is a map that is generally used to show precipitation um, rates in the continental United States. There's a mythological and even scientific line called the 100th meridian. The 100th meridian is a line that uh, scientists have uh, decided is the boundary between um, uh, more uh, uh, an area of the U.S. that has more precipitation and an area that has less. And they call this the 100th meridian. It goes right through, um, as you see, eastern Kansas right here. And you can see um, when you talk about the levels of rainfall, obviously Nevada sticks out. But look at this little section right here south of the Arkansas River. This is where we're at. It's a very arid area. It's fun because when we do this work, a lot of folks um, get offended that um, they live in a desert. <laughs> you know, that we say that they, they, we don't live in a desert. It's a prairie, they say over in Pueblo. And then, you know, it's fine. We'll let, you know, it's a desert prairie, we say. <laughs> fine, fine. Have it. Um, but, but, it, but back to April's point, it's a colonial construct. The concept of a desert is obvious. It's, it's, a, it's a term that was projected onto the West. Obviously, there was no desert there. There was, there was never a wasteland in these regions. And that's part of the work, what our work speaks to. But as we look broader and we start to expand this conversation as we had, um, as we developed it, 41.2% uh, of the land on Earth is deserts or dry lands. 41% of Earth, of land. 2.1 billion people live in the world's deserts and dry lands. 90% of the world's population, of 90% of, of that population is in developing countries. 44% um, of all cultivated land is in dry lands. These, these, we start realizing this conversation is bigger than just where we started in central Phoenix. This is a map of global dry lands. And this, inc this includes like extreme deserts, like you would think of the Sahara being uh, deserts like uh, Phoenix that are very biodiverse and then even high deserts like we have in southern Colorado. It kind of throws them all in together. Dry lands and deserts. Dry lands is more appropriate term. We use that because deserts don't really, you know, it's not an empty wasteland, but we, we played with that term. That's why we call ourselves desert art lab. But this is, remember that 100th meridian we were talking about? This is research out of um, yeah. Yale from a couple years ago and just kind of watch this little animation. So now you have 1980, 2000. See that line? It's moving. The desert is expanding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we at Desert Art Lab, the desert is expanding. We're excited. <laughs> yes. So and that, and that was part of where we took off. You know, um, the desert, again, the, in its projection is seen as this kind of post-apocalyptic space. But if you tap into the, 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 the the generations and really millennia of, of culture 
and food practice tied to the desert, it's an opportunity. As dry land expands, the, the knowledge systems tied and linked to these ecologies are more important than ever. And um, because the desert lands are some of the most degraded, they're also some of the most threatened knowledge systems in the world. You think about the efforts to protect the forests, um, the redwoods. I mean, obviously, it was a struggle. They cut 90% of them down, but <laughs> you know, the, the efforts to protect the dry lands that don't exist. Um, they, 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 you know, it's seen as a blank canvas to do whatever you want. And, and in that, a lot is being jeopardized and lost, especially at a time we need it more than ever. So what do we do as artists? As artists, we, we decided um, to respond through, through our practice and through the, the legacy of land art, earth art. And we wanted to create an ecological installation as an edible landscape on degraded arid land. Degraded. Okay, so um, obviously here in the maps you can see we're in Colorado. Um, this Google map also actually shows um, the dry lands. Um, here you can see Lake Pueblo. You can see how dry the land is around Lake Pueblo. So yeah, on the left, you see Pueblo. This is a close-up. Yeah. In the process of these, like this, you know, for artists to do this kind of thing, how are you going to do that, right? How am I going to, when we're thinking through this as artists, you think, well, I want to create, you know, a degraded, I want to create an installation on degraded land. How am I going to do that? Well, I need land, right? You know, you, you need land, you need resources. Um, so we proposed this project to Creative Capital Foundation, and what do you know, they funded it. So um, this this was the beginning of this kind of like ambitious dream. And as you might recall, um, we had some issues in our prior eco installations with the landowners not wanting cactus. So that experience actually, um, you know, really informed our practice and through that we realized that in order to do the project that we really wanted to realize we needed to own the land ourselves and so the funding from the creative capital yeah. helped us this is um this was a project that was clearly longer and took more time than even a nonprofit or anybody who wants to help you could really be in it for you know um, so this is the, you know, so we, we, we searched and we searched Pueblo, Colorado. That's where I'm from. And as the, as the conversation expanded, as we learned more about the expansion of the desert, we, we found that to be a perfect place. And we searched and searched and searched for a degraded piece of lot. Land wasn't very hard, let me tell you. It's pretty easy. Um, but we found the perfect spot. And actually, this is it right here. You see this spot? It's a road. So the site that we took was 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 used as a road. It, you can't get more degraded than that. Yeah. And um, this was our this was our site. This is the Desert Art Lab field site. And we this was we established this in uh, 2016. And to kick it off, we had you know to initiate the process. We had our first planting of choya at the site with a blessing of community um, indigenous leaders and elders. Uh, we actually had a fellowship tied to it for the first summer. So we had a handful of students, university art, art students, work with us for the entire summer to establish the site. And what we really wanted to do is document what it was. Um, I don't know if I have slides in here, but we spent half the summer not planting, but actually documenting. Um, every little artifact that you could pick up, we, we did. We picked it up and we marked it and we cataloged it. We still have them. In fact, they get exhibited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, trash. it's literally a collection of trash and weeds, but um, yes. And a lot of car parts, actually, tons of car parts. Um, and then we established the first wave of planting. And, you know, this is, um, this was, uh, as you can see, the choya are in the earth. Um, to get one of the challenges we had at the site to establish it was the earth, because it was a road, it was compact to the point where it was like rock. So yeah, with a pickaxe, you could get into it, but at the rate we were going to, there's 150 choy, at the rate we were going, it was going to take us years to plant <laughs> those, not a summer. So um, the I went to the local like 
tractor rental place and I got a, a like an auger is what they call them. They're giant tractors that have a, a drill on them and you're supposed to be able to just drill into anything. Uh, this lamb broke, broke the auger, two of them. And so then finally, I, you know, I was really kind of disappointed and frustrated in the, the, the uh, rental, the tractor place. They, they didn't charge me because it didn't work. They were really great. But the guy was like, have you tried a jackhammer? And I was like, you know, I didn't think of that. <laughs> That's what I used. That's what we had to use. We had to use a jackhammer to get into the earth. That's how hard it was. And to, to be able to get into this, 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 this damaged earth, um, that's what it took. We didn't bring soil in. We just, you know, we trusted the teachings. And I'll, I'll get back to that. And the, so 150 Choya, where did we get the Choya? We got them from all over the community. We spent a whole summer finding Choyas that folks had been taking care of them. And we'd asked if we could take a, you know, a sample of it for the site. And we obviously offered services to trim their Choya. <laughs> so many people said yes. <laughs> Um, this is the site from Google Earth after it was completed. It took about four years for this to actually come up on Google Earth, and it still doesn't really come up very often. You have to be, um, yeah, it's hard to find. This was the first phase of this 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 project that we were just, that we've been discussing. It's a little delayed here. There is. So, uh, 2016 um, was the initial site we had to bring native stone in because the earth is so hard it's like a slide water just runs right off of it i mean it's it's like it's like pavement so the stone kept the water in and um just to add to that we only we don't use any outside irrigation no outside so irrigation. only the natural occurring precipitation is what you know feeds and nourishes these plants this is uh july 2021 so the idea is, I mean, you know, this is the first phase, and I'll show you a second phase, but the idea is these, these choya, through, through a relationship, we just don't leave them. We take care of them. And um, in that process, a lot of um, crafting does go on. And a choya of this kind can get up to 10 feet tall. So, you know, eventually these will be 10 feet tall. And, and when, you walk in, when you walk into the space now, you feel it. But when you walk into it and it's 10 feet tall, you will be immersed in a space that almost is being stripped. Um, one, two weeks a year, they blossom in June. Only two weeks. They have beautiful, radiant magenta flowers that are just, you know, they're like neon. And only two weeks a year, so it's a very special time. Um, but the thing is, is we couldn't plant anything else when we started because the earth was, was rock. The Choya know how to till they can till through that rock. And when they do, they're returning organic material. Believe it or not, there's soil now. Uh, underneath all those rocks, there's actually soil. And that's because of the choya. Now the choya have done the hard work. We are gonna start the first phase of restoring native short desert short grass, which is critical to the project because once you establish the native short grass, you, you keep the weeds out. So right now the weeds are the biggest challenge we have. And um, they won't go away until there's there's something to keep them out. And that's what the native short grass will do. And that, that'll happen in the spring. Um, in the spring, we'll be able to do that. And um, when he says weeds, he means specifically invasive species. Yeah. We, we love weeds, I'll tell you. Yeah. We, that well. we work with other weeds that <laughs> yeah. are native, but we, these are non-native. Yeah, these are invasive, non-native. They, they deplete the soil. So that, that's the issue with them. And they don't allow anything else to grow. That's, that's what we consider a weed. However, when I was first establishing the site and I called the city, to, a Pueblo, to find out what I needed, they were like, what are you doing? And we're like, we're, we're growing stuff. And right away they said, you know, you can't just grow marijuana wherever you want. <laughs> you can't do that. And I was like, no, 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 we're not doing, we're growing cactus. They're like, they just are like, do what you need to do. <laughs> After like, that, don't don't bother us. They're like, don't bother us. <laughs> um, but why do we choose the cactus? There's a, there's a reason. It's all art. It's metaphor. It's crafting. And the, 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 the cactus is an ecological um, super plant. And it's, it's not just, uh, you know, kind of in its natural form special. It's also tied to mythology of the, of the Americas. So um, this is a map of the ancients. Well, it's not that ancient, but the, the, the city of Tenochtitlan, which is, the, which is the, the Aztec capital. 
Uh, Tenochtitlan is named after the prickly pear, the cactus. And, and the, the cactus through the mythology of the Americas comes up time and time again. It is a plant that is tied to this land and is tied to the stories of this land. And that was important to us. When we think about philosophy, when we think about mythology, oftentimes we don't think about the Americas and, and we don't think about our region, especially in the Southwest and the deserts. These plants are tied to that. And, and that was one of the reasons why we really wanted to stick, to stay with it and to, to honor it. And, and, you know, they, they really, they give so, they give so much and take so little. It's, it's really a lesson. And for anyone who doesn't know, Tenochtitlan is Mexico, Mexico City. <laughs> yeah, it's currently Mexico City. And um, actually the, the cactus are, um, when you look at um, the history of the cactus, um, Everything that we know about these types of cactus, they're all from the America. So these yeah. are, and from south, the furthest south, you can go all the way to the furthest. They're in cold regions. There are Obviously, we have them in Colorado. Various types of opuntias, so like the prickly pear cactus that grow and that are native to various regions. So there is a, if there's diversity in, in these plants. And, and just to speak about that, when we talk about living things on earth, these, these plants right here can endure 115 degrees and minus 30 with no water. I mean, they are as resilient as living things come on, on, on this earth. And, and so they are, they're incredible. They're hated, they're hated. And, and th this speaks to that deeper conversation about indigenous ecology and indigenous, indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous culture, you know, and if you hate the plant, you know, and you hate the, the, the resilience, um, you know, there's a bigger conversation going on about. But also you can eat this stuff. And so this was the, this is the, this is the important part. It's food. <laughs> you know, when we talk about sustainability in the dry lands, the technology always gets brought up. You know, like there's some new tech startup everywhere. And actually that's how we started. We were acting like a new startup. And what we realized through our practice is that there's so much we've left behind and left out. It's food. And when we think about what we're gonna eat with less water, cause it's coming, it's here. It's here. Every day you read more stories about this. This right here, this is, this is, this is part of the solution. And it has been for 4,000 years. You know, it's not new. It's been left out. It's been erased. Or stigmatized. Yeah. Um, so here are a couple of other projects that um, kind of engage these concepts of uh, rethinking our, our food systems and our food culture and um, really trying to imagine what it would, what it would taste like, what it would smell like, what it would look like if we uh, ate a desert you know, created a desert centric diet. So a diet based on the limitations of our place, of our experience, of our time. Um, and so these are some of examples, these are some examples of uh, some of the food projects that we've done. This here, the plant that you see growing is uh, considered a weed. <laughs> it's lamb's quarter in English for those of you who might recognize it. Um, it grows prolifically in in Pueblo and other semi-arid, arid regions. Um, it's known as a quelite as well um, in Nahua and in Mexican Spanish. And uh, here we have like our take of a kale chip. It's a quelite chip. Um, it, it's a desert green and yeah. that doesn't take any irrigation. So and, it's, it, and it's ancient. It's been eaten for 4,000 years the, in, in this land. These plants will grow 10 feet tall with yeah. no outside irrigation. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And then here we have um, a nopal en granita, which is a, like a, a sorbet-like uh, dessert that we made out of the prickly pear cactus with lime and chili. And then we're gonna share some work that we developed through the 2021 Mellon Foundation Fellow at Colorado College. And that's part of the exhibit that Cecily had mentioned at, at the Fine Arts Center in Colorado Springs. Um, the, other, the other thing I would like to just mention, go back a bit, we grow all of it. 
So the calitas we grow, the amaranth we grow, the cactus we grow, it took us six years to get to the point where we could work with the plants because we had to grow them first. So it's very slow. If there's anything I could say about the practice, it's an extremely slow practice. And considering that um, the, the high deserts actually have a winter, um, the plants here grow much slower than other places like Phoenix or yeah. the Sonoran Desert where it's warm most of the year. Um, so for us, it's a real lesson <laughs> um, in uh, just, you know, allowing things to uh, to be what they are and to kind of trust that that process. And so um, it's a slow growth. You know, when we talk about this this project um, and we think about um, it's it's life, um, we're thinking, you know, we're looking at 30, 50, 100, yeah, generations really 100 years. So um, through this fellowship, we were able to um, get resources to put into some of the projects we had started. And one of them was the mobile eco studio. This, this was always the intention of the mobile eco studio um, to, to make it into something that we really wanted to make it into. It's a vendor bike. Um, so through that process, we were able to get resources to, to basically, you know, just strip it it's, I don't know if anybody knows what Candy's paint is. Yeah, it's, it's, if you see a low rider, they have Candy's paint. Metal Flake, that's, that's, that's also what's in it. Dayton's, um, I'll show more pictures. But this work will be at a, an exhibit called Chicana, Chicanex Landscapes that's open until February at the uh, Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center. And I honestly, if you've been to anything in Southern Colorado, this is the place to check out. This institution is pretty incredible. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they do really incredible stuff. Um, this is more images of the bike, the mobile eco studio that you, that is in the video. Um, this is an exhibition in Arizona currently. And then it's going to come to Colorado. And then once it's out of exhibition, it'll be free. <laughs> we can use it. <laughs> um, but also part of that, we started exploring um, kind of the history of biological or botanical study. And if you get into the history of botanical study, you'll come across a, an art, a, a thinker and an artist named Anne Atkins who spent um, her life studying native um, uh, algae from England. And what she, she did to study them is use cyanotype. And so we started getting into cyanotype because of this. And that's, that's a piece that you see in here in this exhibit. Now, the process for us to get to a print like that was probably three years. Um, with cyanotype, we, you start real small. You start real small because you want to learn how to control the process. Eventually, we, through the fellowship, we wanted to go really big. And this is an example of how those cyanotypes are made. So they're solar prints. They get exposed to the sun. All the plants we grow, and that's also an important thing for us to create. We do it all outside. And um, um, one of the one of the concepts we were exploring through this process was. Um, informed by an indigenous Chicano scholar by the name of Enrique Salmon. Um, his work uh, really thinks about um, this idea of a concentric ecologies. Um, and so, like, in short, the idea is that uh, we, the, our ecological systems are our extended kin. And so that's kind of how we view um, our plants, our sites, everything that we do, we see them as um, like extended family. And so what we were, um, so the concept we're exploring here is creating um, visuals that um, kind of speak to that idea of, the hu of human and ecological kinship through these kind of solar images and these, these prints. And again, to even get to the point where we could do these, um, our grows, our, our sites of growth had to be years in, four or five years. 
to have the amount of material we needed to do this. And th this is an example of that piece. And yeah, so here you see like these plants as part of an extension of us, of the of, of human form. And then another piece I'm going to show is uh, Awatera. And this one is a piece that we did to launch the second plant phase of planting at the field site. We did this last summer, 2021. And um, basically part of the site is to have that conversation visually to see the plants grow, right? To see them change. I mean, it's a time-based project. Um, the time's long, <laughs> you know, but it is. And, and that's part of it. But part of it is to create a community space that is open to have conversations about this because there just aren't, there, there aren't very many. There, there are, there are very, like, there's not, <laughs> there's very few, especially in where we're at in Southern Colorado. And so um, the, this, this community performance project was an attempt to create um, a, 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 you know, to return a, a performance and community um, ritual around planting, replanting indigenous ecology. I'll share it with you. And I, I won't play it all, but. And the context of this is that our site, the installation is um, right, it's on a mesa right above the Arkansas River. So what you have there is land dancers and water dancers. And the water dancers are collecting water from the Arkansas River and they will actually walk up the mesa, which is right below where we're at. And they will unite with the land dancers and, uh, and establish the first watering, which is the only watering we do. For our plants and and um, each one get one watering and it's that first one and we uh, we did it as a community performance um, what's also important to recognize is uh, water rights in Colorado you know if the you know the water that rains on your roof isn't yours right it, it, we got we get, what did we get two little containers you can you, you, know, you have to fight for two containers water collection containers right and that took well that took a long time that was a couple of years ago but after those two, you don't own that anymore. You barely own that. So that's also what this is a conversation about. That water is um, sacred. Um, this is also a way for us to reconnect our, uh, rich, you know, our, our ceremonial practices with our um, our other practices. Oftentimes, we think of we for a lot of communities, we have our dances, and then there's agricultural practices and most of the dances that um, we've learned and that have been passed down are actually mostly dances that are related to agricultural practices, agricultural cycles. Um, they're ceremonies to honor um, our systems, these systems, um, celestial movements, um, our, our seasons, our existence. And um, for us, this was an opportunity to reconnect um, our, our dancing um, practices with our agricultural practices. And they've just, as I said, they've been disconnected for so long, but really we're connected a long time ago. 
And and that was also the spirit of the project. We we really in, intentionally found an urban plot because uh, we wanted to bring that that conversation into the middle of of the urban space. And that's it's in the middle of Pueblo. Our our site is in the middle of Pueblo. Um, you don't you know rather than have this idea of going out into nature, it's it's right in the center of town, right in the middle of of uh, you know of, of Pueblo. And and uh, that was important to the concept. Well, and we're just going to share a couple of upcoming um, projects. projects. Yeah, so we have um, and we have an installation piece at the Dom Museum in, in Vienna, Austria, that opens next week. Um, it's an exhibit called the Meal, and um, that it's it includes living plants. So we're quite excited about that. Um, I think there's a image of the installation in progress, but it is a salad for a hot or dryer future with a recipe and some menus in English and German. Um, and then we always, we will, we like to end with the words of the elders, um, the way with Latoli, which are basically ancient proverbs of the Americas. These are these are, are the words of the elders, and so I would like to take a moment just to read them to you. Uh, act, take care of the things of the earth, do something, work the land, plant nopal, plant maguey. With that, you will have something to eat, to drink, to wear. With that, you will stand, be true. With that, you will walk. With that, they will speak of you, praise you. With that, you will be known. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> We're happy to take any questions. Yes. Are you, so you talked about planting some other things like so have you started that yet? Yeah, so um, we, we have, so when we started um, our sites in in Southern Colorado and Pueblo, um, we had a couple, actually believe it or not, we, we, it wasn't just one, we got, we have several and that's the one we really focused on because it's public. Um, but there's other sites. One was our studio. Now it's our house because we live in it. <laughs> but yeah, the amaranth grows, the quilites grow, uh, the chimisa grows. So the things you see in the print, those are all um, those are all on another site growing. And and uh, um, some of them are perennials, and they're six years in, seven years in. Some are annuals, like the amaranth, and they come back every year. But the amaranth is it, the kind of amaranth we use would be considered a weed by most. But the calita, same with the quilites. So um, yeah, we have we have different types of grow sites. So I mean, so we have amaranth, right? We're trying to spread it through the neighborhood, and it's kind of going. But I mean, are you doing like the like, harvest in the neighborhood? Yes. Yeah. 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 So and we are actually so um, coming from we lived in Phoenix for quite some time, and in Arizona, and particularly the Sonoran Desert, there are. Lots of amazing organizations that collect and preserve native like seeds, wildflowers, grasses, all sorts of plants that are native to the Sonoran Desert. Um, and that was a tremendous resource. However, here in Southern Colorado, um, those don't exist in the yeah. same way as you might find in other New locations Mexico. like New Mexico. Yeah. And so at the moment we are collecting seeds um, to create our own mix of plants that are are specifically, and, um, you know, to, like specific to the region. And then with the uh, with the choya, it's a perennial. Um, so the harvesting is much different. And um, you actually like to think about growing a peach tree or an apple tree. You, you have to grow the tree first, right, before you really get the fruit. So um, it's actually taking, we're at the point now where we can start to to harvest the, the choya buds in, in the next year. So, but it's taken six years. So, so the, the, when you get to perennial, it's not the year to year. It's more, it's longer, m much longer. I mean, you think about piñones, I think, what is it, seven years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a seven year cycle. 
So, I mean, th this is kind of the conversation. It's, it's not the annual that we're all familiar with. And, with a lot of these plants. And this is kind of, this is our, our reference to those indigenous knowledge systems that are so vital these days. You know, if you were to collect, say, for example, piñones every year, you would have none for, like, the future. And so these um, these cycles are, are really important for us to um, re-engage and to remember. There was another hand, yes. So I was curious, did you, have there been kind of previous experience growing um, plants before you embarked on this journey, other than, you know, the first one that you had talked about? Was uh, well, you know, um, we started a grow project probably almost 20 years ago. Yeah, and it was it was a effort just that was on our own in Phoenix to like convert our grass into an indigenous into arid landscape. So that was our first take on it. It's still there. It's amazing. We don't own the house anymore though. <laughs> so that was our first start at it. But you know, when you get into it, you know, one of the things that was the the, the kind of catalyst for this is that when you get into your family stories, you learn that your your grandparents ate cactus. And, and what does that mean? They grew cactus because you're not in a lot of cases, you're not getting that at the grocery store, especially, you know, 60, 70 years ago. So, we, yeah, we come from a history of, of, of growth. Absolutely. And we wouldn't we wouldn't be here otherwise. You know, we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that. And so, you know, we were trying to do this project in an art way, return to that in, 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 in the way we could. You know, so we had to start. We had to start. And, and yeah, that that was. You know that at this point that was 20 years ago so um yeah you have like a recipe book on your website you know um we don't <laughs> and there's a couple of reasons why we don't um when we started one of the projects was this certification cookbook and that was part of our creative capital funding and and you know when you're an artist you learn from your practice, you know, I mean, you should, right? You, you go in and you think you're gonna do one thing and then you learn your practice and you're like, okay, this is, this is, I'm learning more. And one of the things we really considered was, and we do have recipes, yes, we do. But one of the things that we considered is that these are, these are fluid. These are, these are not by yourself. These aren't just things you're gonna read and then reproduce. These are the space, the, the, the physical space is, is the cookbook. That site is. And and to really learn it, you have to you have to you have to be in the site. And so that's the cookbook for us is those community events we do. It's bringing people in. It's not so simple as oh, I followed all the steps. I'm there. You know, um, it, it's it's a it's a practice. And so we've kind of shied away from creating uh, permanent recipes. Although that installation in Vienna has recipes in it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, and actually the other thing is that um, it's not, I think sometimes for us, like Matt said, we're, we're also learning as we are as throughout our practice. And for us, it's also, um, there's like a disconnect sometimes from the idea of a cookbook or just recipes, right? And for us, it's really important to um, think about how this all happens like how how do these foods grow how to cultivate them how to harvest them how to prepare them how to plant them how it's, to plant them um and so for us that that's part of the recipes um it's strategies for um, maintaining these ecological systems for maintaining relationships with these ecological systems for creating community around these ecological systems for um so it, it, it's, uh, it's and, and, we, and one thing that we get asked when we do things is people say, well, can those go to market? Yeah. And we get asked that all, all the time. time. <laughs> Not for us. You know, for us, it's about cultural practice. And, and there is there are um, examples of, of, of food ways going to market that didn't end so well. Uh, quinoa is, is one. You know, quinoa is an ancient indigenous food practice out of South, based in South America. And it got real popular and real healthy in the Western world. And it got so expensive and did the indigenous communities couldn't even afford it anymore. So there, there's, you know, we don't participate in that part of it. It's, it's about cultural practice. It's about art, really, as a site of cultural practice. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, so it's um, it's a, it's called a cyanotype, and it's basically like a salt-based um, chemical mix. chemical mix. Um, they're not, you know, they're 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 as, as when it comes to photography, they're as, as non-toxic as you can imagine. Some of them are in food, um, and basically, you, you know, it's it's a it's an early form of 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 photography. You know, very early, and it was used not in the way that we think of photography. It was used almost like a copy machine. So blueprint. The, yeah, <laughs> blueprint. So, so it's really seen as a, it's like that. It was an early copy machine, and but like Ann Atkins used it to d document native flora, and it was really well done. And you know, it's a it, when you when you go small, it's pretty great. It's pretty fun, but to go large is really difficult because um, you know uh, it's it is like it's UV sensitive. So when you are making a six foot print, you know you have to you know you have to have space. You have to have you know it doesn't have to be dark, but you have to have dark space. And if you don't, you have to do it at night. You know, <laughs> so you can only you know you got to mix this. You got to mix the the chemical solution, and then you you know you have to. Uh, wait till you have time to, to paint it, but you basically paint it on. You paint on a, uh, an emotion, emulsion, and then um, what we do is we put it in, uh, you know, we put it in basically black trash bags. So we have to wrap it in trash bags so we can store it. And then when we have time, we make the prints. We do it all outside though. So what, what, what's cool about the, the cyanotype, it's not very sensitive. So you can roll it out, and it's not like photo paper, where if you if you expose that within seconds, it's done, right? Cyanotape takes more like minutes. So you can roll it out. You still got to go fast, but you can roll it out. You can put all your plants on it. You got to have everything really organized, no doubt. But um, you, you have to roll it out, and then you know what's fun about the 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 the, the process is really any anything can go on it. And um, but what we were inspired by was that that process of kind of sharing form and. And uh, yes, yeah. it has been. Yeah. So yeah, it's history. I I think it's it's real. Like um, as an as an art form, it's it's kind of um, it it really um it really kind of did its its strength was in botanical documentation. And then, and then if you Google Ann Atkins, you'll see it right away. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what was the name of the His name's Enrique Salmon, and he's based out of um, U East, uh, yeah. um, California State University, East Bay. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's, he's really he's, great. Yeah. yeah he's... Oh, it's okay. Um, I'd love to hear more about the, the fellows and what they. The, oh, the, oh, the fellows, our fellows. Yeah. Oh, so. Um, they, we took, we kind of looked at it as like a field school. So we had readings, you know, we talked, we, we you know, Lectures. not too many, <laughs> <laughs> not too many, but, um, you know, there was readings, there was uh, uh, like um, hiking trips where we, because this is out of context. You got to remember where our site's at. It's in the middle of an urban space. So it is in a way out of context. So we'd go into context, right? So we'd go on, on these hikes into these spaces where you could see this space. Um, and there's not too many on Disturbed, but there are some in, in Southern Colorado and, and actually in Pueblo County. There are some where, you know, there's thousand year old junipers still to this day right now. And, and so, you know, we, we did a study. Um, we did community outreach where like, uh, you know, so the process of kind of engaging the community to um, develop our, our, uh, our, our, you know, those, those plants all came from the community. So that they helped us with that. Um, honestly, to be honest with you, at some point the labor became beyond what a fellow could do. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding. Like it, it was, it got to the point where it was very hard labor. So at that point, we we didn't expect they didn't do any of that. Actually, we had paid help. We had labor. We we actually had the, you know we had a paid staff at that point to do it. So they they weren't working the jackhammers or anything. <laughs> um, and we did actually provide each of them with a with a, a scholarship or a yeah. stipend. So we paid each of them. Yeah. And um, actually one of the, I think, nice surprises that came out of that is one of our fellows uh, went to graduate school and is now a university professor, yeah. uh, art professor. Yeah, in the Midwest, in Iowa. 
The other is a grad student at CSUP at Colorado State University Pueblo, and she was in the performance that. So six years later, the second wave of performance, she was in it. She was one of the people carrying the vessels. So, um, you know, they're still with us. Um, they still, they want to come back all the time. Like, hey, I want to come back and work at the site, you know. And so they're, they're part of the, um, they're still, they, yeah, they're still a part of the project. And there was three, there was three. One was from Kansas State University. One was from CSUP, Colorado State University Pueblo. Actually, no, it was Fort Collins. Yeah, it was, it was oh, Colorado yeah. State University, Fort Collins. Yes. And then one was from Pueblo Public Community, Community College. College yeah. The one that was at uh, Fort Collins is now in grad program in uh, CSU Pueblo. So that's why she's still around and we get to, she still wants to you know, help out. I'm yes. so curious about um, your neighbors in yeah. Pueblo. That's a good one. The, the landowner, owner in Phoenix, and it's surprising to hear that he was so against the yeah. practice. Yeah. So I'm curious about your neighbors in Pueblo and if, how you worked with them and what their reaction has been and how yeah. you influenced them. I'll oh. tell one story and then I'll let Matt tell another. Yeah, um, they've been great. Yeah. Honestly, they've been all in. They've been so enthusiastic. They've been like awesome. I, I will say at first, though, when we told them what we were doing, they all kind of giggled, thinking like, oh, how cute. You're going to try and grow stuff here. Yeah, they're like, uh, nothing's going to grow. Yeah, they're like, nothing can grow there. That land's dead. That was. The, and so now that things are growing, they're like astonished. I mean, yeah. they're all this. Most of them are the same neighbors. They think it's magic. And it's not. It's desert ecology. It's sticking to what works. It's working with the land, not against it. Um, but you know what's happening here. Denver's expensive. People from Denver moved to Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs is, is expensive. People from Colorado Springs moved to Pueblo now. We have not seen this movement of people to Pueblo probably since the steel mill opened. You're talking 100 years, right? And so, but it's happening now. People from outside of Pueblo, from northern Colorado, are moving into Pueblo. And one of uh, the families that lived behind us was an old Pueblo family. And you got, you got to understand, Pueblo is an old Chicano community. When I say old, many of the community people, many of the community, they've lived in that region for, for a time before it was the US. Old, and they've been there in the same houses. No kidding, same neighborhoods. Same neighborhoods. It's, it's awesome. I for mean, like six, seven, eight yeah, generations. Yeah, very common, yeah. and that's what our neighbors are. Well, one of the neighbors behind us who was very helpful, they, I mean, they, they, were, they were helping us move rock and stuff. They were so into it. And uh, always out there while we were, um, sometimes with a bottle of tequila, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they moved. The elderly, um, their their parents. One, it was a family. Their parents were very old. The, the the kids would come and help them. The parents were just too old to be living on their own, and they they sold the house. And it was in limbo for about three, four years. That was the first year. Finally, this year, somebody bought it, and and. Uh, and we thought, well, okay, somebody bought that house. It's right behind our site. We didn't think much of it, but within a couple of months uh, of that house being purchased, we, Desert Art Lab gets an email and it says, uh, basically, I just bought the house behind you. I wanna buy your land. We thought, well, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm not responding to that. You know? <laughs> and then we get a, a letter in the mail and it's like all, all right, caps, home. no kidding, to our house. And to it's like, house. I wanna buy your land, you know? like. And so it was like, oh, things are changing. Um, I'm at the site all the time. So, the, you know, I, how do I know the neighbors? Because I'm at the site. I don't, they don't have my cell phone number. Some of them don't use cell phones. You know, they, it's, it's old school there. Pueblo is old school like that. And uh, finally, eventually, this individual finds me out there and he comes over. He's like, you know, hi, I'm friendly. I'm your neighbor. And I said, you know, within, you know, a couple, we greeted each other, but I just told him, you know, this is not for sale. And he was like, you got my messages. I was like, yes, I did. And, you know, this isn't for sale. And, um, you know, we had a conversation about that. And he said he wasn't trying to buy up the whole neighborhood, you know. And but this is the pressures that are going on. Yeah. And this is why we had to own the law. This is why we had to own our, pre our property, because, um, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And um, ever since that conversation, I have gotten no letters and no um, emails or anything. So I think, you know, it's pretty clear that this isn't like a site for sale. So and that's what I told him. But 
he told me that he asked everybody if they were selling their land. So I was like, oh, okay. Wow, you're awesome. <laughs> but you know, we, we've never seen things like that. You, you got to understand Pueblo, the property values in Pueblo when we started this. And we weren't, you know, it was much different than it is now. And these weren't sites that were seen as valuable at all or worth anything or anybody wanted. And, um, you know, the site we had, had we done nothing to it, trust me, he wouldn't want to buy it because it was a road. <laughs> it was literally a road. So, you know, um, but believe it or not, some of our neighbors did not like that. They didn't like it. And, and they have basically come out and, you know, in a way, um, and we've never asked any, you know, there, there's many plots of land in this area we're at. We've never asked the question about that. We've never asked our neighbors, hey, are you selling that, you know? But after this happened, several na a neighbor came up to us and said, you know, basically, we want to offer you to acquire these other properties from us because of what's going on. And I don't know if we will or not, but that to us was like, oh, they really, they, they feel like they want to make sure this keeps going. And that, that was cool. You know, that was a cool uh, situation. And these aren't folks we talk too much. I mean, you know, in the last six years, you know, we see them once a year. You know, we're not in their business. It's important. We don't get into their business, but if they're always open to come, you know, we know we don't try to force this on anybody. We don't promote this in the community like you would expect. We just, you know, we do our, our thing. We keep it going, but we're not trying to shove this in everybody's face. I mean, it's our site to work and, and it's and it's a site for people to discover. We see it as that. So we don't put the address out there. It's not it's out there really and it's on purpose. It's intentional. People find it, and that's that's important to us. I also wanted to add that um, another reason why it's important for us to own the the space is that actually um, these ecological systems, as we said, they don't exist in the marketplace, right? So in order to maintain our um, inherited and traditional food practices, how are we going to access? The traditional foods that aren't available commercially. Um, so you think, oh, well, I could just go collect them, but actually you can't um, because most of nature is owned by someone. Either it's um, private land or it's federal land or the state owns it or the city owns it. And so it complicates our relationship with our, the, our traditional ecological systems and food practices. And so that's another um, kind of that's another reason why owning this space and having the ability to engage with it as we want is really important to us. And that, and that speaks to us as, you know, identifying as Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx. We see that as our entry point into our indigenous past. And in the Southwest, that is, um, that, that's our story. That's, that's why we're here. And so for us, that's really important that we engage that story. and and. This, the, 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 our food practice, our ecological practice connects us to that. And, and, that's, that's, and that's one of the reasons why we identify our organization as that. Okay. Yes? I just wanted to get back to the amaranth. <laughs> so what, what the that? amaranth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, we can go on forever about amaranth. Amaranth, this is great. Um, like, if you're a what is, is it a indigenous, um, you know, dry land, amaranth from that region? Yeah, so, you know, amaranth is a very, um, it, the word is used to describe a lot of plants. So the amaranth that we're, we are engaging is the one that you wouldn't get seeds for. It grows um, naturally wild in the West. And the part you eat on our amaranth is the, is the leaf. Right. It's not the seed. Yes. Yes, okay. exactly. So um, it's a version of pigweed. So this is important. That's where I was going is that this has become so. So one of the first things the Spanish did when they colonized the Americas was ban amaranth. They went right after food practice. Amaranth has been attacked for 500 years. Um, the latest version of that attack is through multinational chemical companies that create things like Roundup Ready seeds. Amaranth can grow as a weed and farmers don't like it because it takes more labor to get rid of it. So they have seeds that they can grow their plants and then spray chemicals all over the place and it doesn't kill their seed or their plant, but it kills the amaranth. 
Well, guess what? Amaranth is never going anywhere. It figured this out and it's now Roundup Ready resistant. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is a real issue. You know, the chemical companies are furious, but Amaranth won't stop. And so there's campaigns across the Midwest to eradicate Amaranth and they changed the name to pigweed. So they call it pigweed, the ancient Amaranth. And there's literally signs in the Midwest that say, they have pigweed with an X it's through a big it. Red X. And, and it, you know, and, and so and so that, but the amaranth persists, and we grow that kind of amaranth. Yes, we grow the amaranth that is Roundup Ready resistant. And you think about the story of colonization. That's what we're. That's what we have now. You know, it, it's not the past. It's something else. You know, <laughs> and and the amaranth is a real inspiration for us. I think it seems like we um, got to everyone's questions. We'll be available if anyone yeah, has any additional questions. Thank you all for uh, coming, and it was a pleasure. <laughs> Want to do a shout out to my sister Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't remember the date, but it's October 13th. <laughs> it's the 13th of October. Thank you. So I hope you'll be one of the artists speaking. Um, so we hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much for coming and take a look around. Thank you. Thank you.